want my sexy, ooh, mental health intellectual confidant. Welcome to another episode of Confidently Insecure, the podcast where we are absolutely sure we don't know everything. I am your host, Kelsey Dara, and I'm so excited for this week's guest. He is a certified sex therapist. That's right. An indivi- a licensed individual and relationship psychotherapist who specializes in relationships and sex. He is stacked. Listen to these degrees. A bachelor's degree in cultural psychology from New York University. Honey, we know that ain't cheap. And a master's degree in mental health counseling from the University of Miami, a fellow sort of Floridian. And I know him as a, uh, the viral therapeutic therapist on Instagram. I'm so excited to introduce Todd Barrett. Thanks so much for joining. Hi, Kelsey. Thank you for having me. I don't know if I can really meet all of that, but, um, but <laughs> I'm excited to be it's here. very early. Uh, yeah. I'm so jazzed to have you on. You, I mentioned offline, you are a friend of our friend of the pod, Zach Nui Towers. Mm-hmm. And no, I, before we get into all of the juicy therapy goodness, I want to ask, how do you come up with your viral Instagram posts on your d- diagnosense. Am I saying that right? Diagnosis. Diagnosis. Just so like nonsense. Like, what is like the life story? is nonsense. Well, hi, Matt. It's nonsense. Um, I go. mean, it's basically all about me because I'm so self-involved. <laughs> um, so it's all of the things I experience. No, um, no, no, no. Um, it's about me. It's about my clients. <laughs> it's about, I don't know, um, something I see on TV. Um, it's not a mystery. I think it's just a lot of the things that we're all going through. Um, so everything I post is something that I've been through. I've talked about in therapy. I talk about with a client. Um, I hate in the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> all of that. There's a lot to choose from. There's a lot right to now. choose from when it comes to hatefulness. Yeah. But I have to yeah. I try to keep it under control. And I yeah. love like, dare I say the aesthetic, like you bring a very dare you gorge say. aesthetic to a therapeutic conversation, which I feel like is important to make it not sound so sciencey and scary. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I am not a graphic designer, but um <laughs> I want I like the shit that we go through to see it in black and white is so um boring. So, I don't know. Yes. I like color even though everything I wear is not colorful and I don't like color <laughs> in my decor. But if I'm looking at something, I want to see vibrant colors and um, mm-hmm. fun fonts, um, even though I'm getting sick of my graphics, but anyway, yeah. Thank you. Oh, well, we love them. Um, Thanks. I want to know Go what ahead. made you want to work in sexual wellness therapy in general? How does one get there? Um, well, it's <laughs> been my whole sexual career, um, <laughs> professionally and personally. Uh, no, I mean, I've been in therapy forever and my, for my therapist who I still see today, uh, he's a sex therapist. And, um, it's just, it's always been a part of my therapy. So I just thought Mm. that that's what everybody talks about. Everybody just talks about (laughs) sex in or out of therapy. And then, and this is starting when I was like 13. Um, and then I quickly realized that, you know, in the nineties, people are not talking about sex. I wasn't 13 in the nineties. When was I 13? I'm 35. (laughs) We're we're going to I'm not doing math right now. We don't, we don't, we can, Um, we, we're not doing the math. It was at some point in this culture where we were not really talking about sex, being queer was, you know, not so trendy and chic. Um, not like it really is now, but, um, but so <laughs> I talked about that in therapy and it was just really helpful for me because I was having sexual mm-hmm. issues. Um, I would get anxious. I'd get performance anxiety. I couldn't get hard, couldn't get off. I was doing tons of mm-hmm. drugs, which also wasn't helping. Um, mm. so then as I got older and started working in school, um, or studying in school, still no topic, and discussion about sex, um, went to grad school for wow. therapy, still no, there was one class on sexuality and it covered sexuality, sex, and like multicultural. It was like all one class. And I was like, what? no. Um, so it was just became very apparent to me that when I started working, like sex would be something that I would be talking about all the time with my clients. Um, so yeah. that's what I did. And then I, there was a certification process, which I did, which. I don't, not, not regret just cause there was a lot of hoop jumping and, um, I knew a lot of the information already. Um, but, um, yeah. And so that's what I do. And so the clients that I see, I see individuals and couples now, um, and 
some of them are coming in for purely sexual issues, but most people are coming in about sexual relational issues because that's really what sex mm. is, is about. It's not just a, a wow. genital inserting right. into a space. It's about, you know, <laughs> the reality that in the context that um, happens when we're getting naked. Um, yeah. So that's relational, wow. emotional, and psychological. So um, when I'm seeing a client, you know, it's really about much more than sex. Everyone's always mm. like, what's the like, the dirtiest thing you've ever, I'm like, we talk about anxiety. Like, that's like, it's like really not that. Like, what's the craziest thing you've ever heard? I'm like, uh, I don't know. What? Someone got scared. They weren't going to come. <laughs> I mean, it's really like that's human so relational stuff. Yeah. Um, well, so long story short, that's, my, that's yeah. my journey. Yeah. It's a huge misconception, I think, for people. I mean, okay. I have a million questions based on what you said. I identify queer, bisexual. I'm in an open relationship relationship very non-traditional and mm -hmm. saw a sex therapist for a long time oh. and am Ooh. laughing uh it gets kind of dark and sad but she was actually murdered her name was dr amy she was in los angeles and she was murdered i really by her... was not expecting you to go i know i am so sorry she I was took murdered a, a by her ex-boyfriend that uh. she had a restraining Why order against. So familiar? It was all like over the news. She's kind this. of like a celeb sex therapist too. She oh like dated um, Drew Carey at one point, but she was kind I of like iconic. This. Yeah, in the BDSM scene. So like when people are like, "Well, why did you stop?" I'm like, oh, uh, "She go? was killed. Oh my she god, she was murdered." Um, but That's I awful. learned so much in that time, and and I'm laughing because it really was ever very rarely about the physical act of sex. It yeah, was no, exactly. so much almost more cutting and deeper into the emotional stuff than some regular, say, CBT therapy I had done oh, um, in no. the past. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to rewind just a little bit, like right and talk about the lack of education that comes with uh. sex therapy in getting degrees like you are stacked honey those schools you went to are very well respected like i know you put a lot of effort and time into school but Thank you. what are we expected to do as people who maybe are wanting to get into the sexual wellness like where do we learn where are we supposed to get any of the education from um well i mean specific trainings are really limited in general because they're geared mm. towards training for a specific thing. So, um, mm. like mental health or marriage isn't really going to incorporate sex into it. Just like mm. it's going to be a lot of that training is geared towards diagnosis and all of that shit. So, right. you know, we kind of have to do our own work, um, which, you know, ideally we would just go to elementary school and like the learning about relationships, sex and life and taxes and stuff would start then, but you know, <laughs> we just like, left to figure it all out on our None own, but that. we must learn algebra for sure. Um, <laughs> solve for X. Um, but yeah, books, um, for therapists, mm. there is a ton of different trainings. Now I think it's probably, it's much different. I have friends that are in grad programs that have like entire programs on queer sex. And I'm like, where the fuck was this when I needed it? Um, right. <clears throat> so I just did that all on my own. Um, but now there wow. are books coming out left and right that are really wonderful books. Um, you know, we were just mm. talking about Jen's book. Um, yeah. Jen Winston, um, yeah. great book. There are tons of books about sexuality, um, mm -hmm. expansive, diverse, really great educational books. Um, yeah. But that's the the sucky thing is that it's kind of, you know, all of the ways in which we deal with sexual anxieties, they're created in, in every context. So even mm -hmm. a lack of education and having to do the work ourselves, like that's a communication that we shouldn't do these things, right? So we have to really even work through mm -hmm. that, if, if that makes right. sense. You know, the idea that we have to find out on our own and seek out information on our own is really hard, especially when it comes to our body. So, um, uh, yeah, books, mm. courses online. Um, like I have a sex course online. Many sex yes. therapists do, um, same with relationships. So it's a lot of self-directed, um, mm. learning, which is kind and, of shitty. I really, you know, I really yeah. wish there was like infrastructure somewhere. Right. Um, in our lives, there's right. required learning on how to be a human being, not just for sex, but, and just in a, like a general kind of, okay. And what do you need to do to function? Like, this is how you survive in the world. It's kind of weird that, yeah. you know, as a culture, we really <clears throat> emphasize so much on work and all of this other stuff, which is necessary, but we have no outlet for relational, <laughs> sexual, social learning. It's just bizarre to me. Right. But. No, I mean, it, you bring up such world. a good point. We, we've talked about it here on the podcast a lot about how, you know, 
we're not even close to getting the sexual wellness education in the years that it should be taught and that it should matter. Yeah. Like we're still teaching abstinence and there are still schools that are oh, fighting to take away sex I education can't. as a complete whole. And if we're not going to get it in school, I mean, we're, we're not even getting taxes in school, but that's a whole nother conversation. They don't want you to no. know how to do your taxes. Now I sound like I mean, a I can't even talk about taxes. Person. Now I'm going to be very triggered. <laughs> I may not be able to continue I know. This. I'm like, let's go back to dicks. Let's I like that. Let's not talk about taxes, uh, <laughs> dicks, clits, and the rest. I can't. Uh, um, but I, I do, do you think there is a proper age to be learning about this stuff? Because I watch a lot of TikToks. And I love good luck a to your child. <laughs> I know. I watch a lot of like parenting TikTok. Where, I don't know why I don't have kids and I don't want them. But I have to say, they, what what, what I you to the parenting one? I know. I the algorithm got me. a part of you that wants to be a parent. No, I I have cats. That's fine. Um, and one that's could argue parent. that I parent myself and my partner every day. Um, mm. but I see a lot of that moms taking it on themselves to introduce like the lingo very like maturely to kids like toddlers and i'm like do we have an age where it feel like coming from a sex th educator therapist do you feel like there is a correct age to be doing this um i mean it really depends on your kid and and what they're asking about but i mean in terms of like research, so most kids will see porn when by the time they're nine, oh, right? So, wow, you know, I mean, kids are walking around. I think kids know how to use their phones better than I do. I mean, yeah. like they have phones with access to yeah. porn. They're talking or their older brother has a friend's older brother and they go to the friend's house and the older brother and they have their older brother's porn and blah, blah, blah. Um, so like porn is out there. Sex is out there. It's on TV. It's everywhere. So. I think the sooner the better, you know, I think the challenge is that people really overthink it and they're like, oh my God, the children, like, oh my God, you know, we're going to ruin their life. And it's like, hello, they're going to grow up and fuck. So like, you know, <laughs> it, and they're holding a phone that has access to like naked bodies. Mm -hmm. They literally came out of a vagina. So like you, you may, they're going to be curious about that. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm not saying as soon as they can walk and talk, you should sit them down and show them a whole PowerPoint about, you know, the body, pleasure and masturbation. I mean, not no, but I mean, if we lived in a world that wasn't so sexually freaked out, it wouldn't even be a thing. Like we would just talk to kids mm -hmm. about sex and it wouldn't be, oh my God, you know, this is really scary. What do we do? Close mm. your eyes, blah, blah, blah. Mm. You know, so all, even the question of, you know, when do we do the, you know, it's, that's just based on sexual fear that you grew up learning about and probably mm -hmm. how you were shielded from looking at, I don't know, a, a breast or a butt or whatever on TV mm -hmm. when it came up or how you couldn't watch R rated movies or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just making assumptions about your, no, I, you're, you're <laughs> nailing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think as early as possible, start having conversations. It's like, when would you start talking to kids about food? I don't know. Right there away. They start eating. They have to eat to live. Right. Um, that's and such a good point. Pleasurable and a yeah. loaded topic now and too, but um, mm. yeah, I don't think it's too soon. What are the TikTok yeah. videos saying? I, I mean, the ones that come across my for you page, they are very like pro, just saying the anatomy. Like, there's no Great. nicknames for things, and like adults, you know, do certain things that kids not can't do, but learn as they get older. And there's a lot of emphasis on like relationship and. I think, I don't know, this might be a, a controversial subject, but do you believe you should be learning to have sex with people that you care about and people that care about you? Or can we be like talking about casual sex? With children? Yeah, like, I, I don't know, as a teenager, right? Like uh, I was I drilled mean, into the idea that like, you are supposed to be in love and it's supposed to be magical and special. And it was the back of a fucking pickup truck oh in God. a parking lot. And it that hurt and hot. it sucked. Oh, it was no, awful. No, no, no. Awful. Just the back of a pickup truck in a parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Now my 31 year old self, I'm like, was that? I meant to say, um, do we know anyone that owns a pickup truck? <laughs> <laughs> no, I grew up in Florida. I may so. need to borrow it. Yeah. We're in Florida. Tampa. Tampa. Scary. Okay. Yeah. yeah now I know why it's recovered. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not my life <laughs> Miami any better. Florida. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. No, I actually, I love Florida. I um, right. love hate it. Um, but I mean, I wouldn't be like saying, okay, like Sal, I don't know who Sally is. But <laughs> Let's make Sally, it Sally. You're eight years old. Like 
you know, it's really hot if you have casual sex with like <laughs> Dom Top Five in the bathroom at a gas station, you know. But <laughs> I mean, casual sex is sex, you know. I, yeah. I mean, but yeah, no, kids are really encouraged, whether it's based on religion or based on values or based on just I don't know, whatever horrible things. Um, that sex yeah. is between two people that love each other and right. when they're ready and they're married and they're um, but. Um, no, I don't think that's something that should be taught. No, I agree. It's like, you should only eat food with people you love and want to spend the rest of your life with. I I don't know. I just keep going back to food as an analogy. No, it it works very well. Because it's so destigmatized. We don't Mm -hmm. don't even think twice about like, who would I eat dinner with? Obviously sex is much more vulnerable than eating dinner. Yeah. For sure. Um, and when I say sex, I don't mean penetration of whatever. I just mean pleasurable interaction with somebody you think you want to fuck. Um, yeah. But if food, so yeah, (laughs) I think, you know, it's just because sex is so loaded, um, that we're like, how do we, what are we, I don't know. Is this okay? Um, when yes, the answer is yes, it's all okay. But there will be people and there are, which drives me fucking crazy. Um, they're like, what about rape and what about murder? And what about Mm. all of these terrible things? I'm like, we, I mean, obviously that's not, that's not good. Um, you know, I'm not endorsing just this kind of, uh, free for all, but you know, when Mm -hmm. it comes to sexuality, um, most expressions of sex that are consensual are wonderful. Why do we not care about safety with sex when we're teens? And I might be speaking too much from personal experience, but like I said, drilled, (laughs) use a condom, don't get pregnant, like take birth control. I was put on birth control when I was 14. Never used a fucking condom. The guys never used a fucking condom. Like it was, I got chlamydia from the second person I ever slept with. Like oh, was well, never at least you got coming. That over with right away. Yeah, I was like, it's not that bad, guys. It's ten days of pills. You're fine. But yeah. there was like, is there? Is it the tabooness, or are we afraid of the idea that we're being safe during sex, and that means we're lame? Or do we like? Why don't? Why aren't we safe about it when we're young? Even into our twenties, let's be real. I'm guilty. I was like, what? I was like, what is this? Just a young thing? I didn't realize that. <laughs> no, okay, um, fair, fair. I started early. I'll get that out there. Well, I mean, even I think the idea of safe sex, like as opposed to risky sex, like I remember when I was growing up and I was doing research in undergrad and I was researching about gay sex. It was all about risky sex. There was no mm. pleasurable sex. There was no sexual mm. challenges gay men experience. It was all like risky sex, HIV, and meth addiction. Um, <laughs> you know, Still. It, it, um, but as an indirect way of kind of getting your question. It's all about sexual fear. Um, mm. And then that's, again, not me encouraging, you know, go have sex with 500 people at the corner and, you know, whatever. I'm not not saying that. Like, if you want to do that, I fully yeah. support you. And I think sure. would be very impressed. Um, yeah. That's a lot. But uh, no, it's it's sexual fear um, mm. is why people are encouraged, you know, safe sex, safe sex, safe sex. I mean, it's also healthy. You know, we, we want to protect ourselves. But to some extent, if we're going to be having sex, we're going to, it's like, if you're going to go outside, you may catch a cold. If you're going to be having sex mm-hmm. with multiple partners, you know, the chances are uh, increased that you'll get an STI. Um, but your right. question was, why do we like risky sex? I, that's also part of my question is, why do we like risky sex? Why do we like it? Um, I don't know. It depends upon what type of sex you're talking about. If you're talking about uh, sex without barriers, so without condoms or whatever, or sex with strangers, or I don't know. Um, those things that are traditionally thought about as risky, um, it really depends on the person. So some people don't like mm-hmm. using condoms cause they don't like the feel of it. They say it's right. more intimate without, they want to be bred. They want to be, you know, mm-hmm. they want to get pregnant or metaphorically or literally. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it can be erotic for people. I just certainly yeah. don't like the words risky sex. I know that it's like this word mm-hmm. people use it. Um, but I don't. I don't like it because who defines what that is? Everyone's going to mm-hmm. say something different depending on their geography, sure. religion, and background. Yeah. So some people might say casual sex is risky, whereas other people mm-hmm. might say it's normal. A straight person mm-hmm. might say, oh my God, I would never hook up with two different people in, the, in a week. Um, yeah. I don't know. That, but, you know, for me, that's just a typical week. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Um, Tuesday. <laughs> but uh, where am I going with this? I don't know. I, but, I was um, just following you. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. I'm lost. Um, no, it was it was risky sex. I I, I think yeah. you you put it nicely too. Is that like risky can mean a bunch of things to different people and to blanket yeah. states. It's kind of like ethical like... porn. Everyone has very right. different ethics. 
Right, right. Like a hundred percent. I, I, I wondered, you know, when you were talking about the, I have to imagine there's like a caveman cave person instinct to breed, right? Like that is what some people will argue the purpose of sex is right like oh, especially that. if you grow up in church right it's like you are doing oh. this to procreate did you grow up in the church the... that told you to procreate yes. and breed did yes, they use the words I, was... breed? I don't think they ever said breed but it was like i did a imagine? purity ring ceremony i mean it, that may be where my kink started was just like i was about to say i think now off. i know the answer to your question <laughs> yeah. purity ring in the yes it was was it a cute ring s- it was pretty cute. Yeah, I got it from Jamaica. It was clear with uh, little diamonds in it. it that makes me uh, sound so privileged. Um, I take back everything yeah. I said. It, I, it broke like the next year, and then I started fucking like crazy when I was 15. So, But it wasn't pleasurable it was sex. Be. I'll say that. It took me a long time to have pleasurable sex. Um, but I want to talk about gay sex. Fuck the heteros. Yeah. We talk about them all the time. Yeah, enough. I want to talk about like where do we... I'm going to ask this like I'm a like I'm an old white Republican church going lady like. Oh, I love that character. Is, yeah. Like put on my full Karen mask. Like, please. What? Like, how did gay sex start if the purpose of sex is to procreate? Like, wh- when did we take this turn into pleasure dumb and like self-fulfillment? Like, well, wh- how did that happen? End scene. That character is very hard. That was to play. great. I mean, you should really Thank think you. about bringing that character to life full time. <laughs> Taking that um, on stage. Yeah. Um, I don't even know. I'm just whenever I hear values like that, I just I get so shocked by just the mm. the, the wildness of it. I don't know. Um, I also mm. don't really ever talk to people who have values like that, so I'm like I don't even know. Maybe clients' um, parents or something, right? <laughs> yeah. Although that's why I don't work with children. Um, but that's just bias. I mean, there's no, I mean, people have been having gay sex forever. Um, yeah, it's just bias that people grow up with thinking that this is natural. I hate that word natural. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Um, yeah, it's just bias, mostly religious bias. So people read yeah. the Bible. I've never read the Bible, but so I hear yeah. people Lucky. say <laughs> the Bible doesn't talk about gay sex. So if the Bible doesn't no. talk about gay sex, then, you know, right. it must be a mystery or some kind of yeah. disease. Right. Um, right. but no, I mean, I don't, I don't really actually know the history of when gay sex was first identified. Is that even, a I thing? feel like it had to start with like be. protozoas, like little, yeah, like I've seen memes before that humans existed. That, yeah. <laughs> or I love the memes where it's like, they're not gay. They're just friends and they're like, oh, each other classic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but this is how culture oh. really shapes sex and sexuality and the way we understand it and, you know, how politics shape the way we think politics and shape science and, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that being gay was a disease for a yeah. while. You know, these are the things that, um, really, um, impact how we understand our bodies and how we use them and right. how we, the opinions we oppress other people with, um, based on what we think is true. Um, and it's just bullshit. It's all wrong. Yeah. I remember, right. I remember the, I remember like, as far as I can remember being bi and there wasn't like this really like awakening. It just always felt like a part of me as far back as I can remember. And I often have said on the podcast, like I, I did everything with a woman before I ever did with a man, but I didn't really like, I'm making air quotes count it because I was so told that like sex is this one thing, penetration, penis, and vagina. And then now, you know, 30 years later, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's all these other iterations that people are so lucky to be learning that sex doesn't necessarily have to involve any of those things. Um, I wanted to ask if someone is exploring and having sex with someone of the same sexuality of the first time or, or the same genitalia or same identity as them for the first time, how can we get over that fear of like, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing because I've been told or seen in media or porn that sex goes like one way. Like two pumps, penis and vagina, (laughs) and then an orgasm. Um, (laughs) well, I mean, uh, the, the fear, I mean, I still have sexual fear. I think that the challenge is that, you know, it's kind of like, how do I feel less anxious in relationships? It's like, well, mm. you know, you're, you're going to feel anxious. Yeah. You're just going to deal with it. Um, yeah. I, and I don't mean to be dismissive, like just deal with it. That's the truth. <laughs> um, to some extent, if we're 
queer living in a heteronormative world and even, you know, straight, cis straight people have sexual fear. I mean, everyone has sexual fear. Mm -hmm. We live in a world that is fear based when it comes to sex, you know, it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. So one, it's normal, you know, it's just going to happen. But two, because queers don't necessarily aren't watching TV and seeing queer sex without Mm -hmm. feeling ashamed of themselves if someone else is in the room, um, who's straight, Mm -hmm. um, it's going to trigger all of that stuff, all of that shame, all of that fear and everything. Um, Mm -hmm. so, uh, the way that you deal with it is you really kind of just need to have a lot of sex. <laughs> no, um, no, actually, yes. yes. I mean, you, you need to have practice. Um, mm. You know, it's like it's like dancing. If you suck at dancing, which I do, I'm like Elaine on I, I just yeah. kind of like twitch. <laughs> um, but you need to practice. You know, you need to practice mm. and you need to learn. Um, and you need to think about what you want to do. Um, and But this is where a little effort goes a long way and why I like doing sex therapy is that, you know, mm oftentimes when it comes to like depression or anxiety, sometimes it's just kind of like, you know, the shit we kind of have to learn how to manage and cope with Mm. forever. Um, not to sound too hopeless, but, um, when it comes to (laughs) sex, you know, the, we can learn specific things. We can work through our shame. We can work through the experience of living in a heteronormative world, um, internalized queer, trans, gay, Mm. homophobia, Mm. et cetera. We can learn Mm. about our bodies, feel better connected to their genitals in ways that feel powerful. Mm. Um, mm. learn to love our genitals. I don't even mm. like the word genital. We need to invent mm. a different word. Um, that <laughs> it describes worst. all parts yeah. of pleasure. Yeah. Um, it's a terrible word. Um, yeah. So a, like a lot alien. of learning, a lot of unlearning, um, and then a lot of practice. Um, mm. and if you kind of do that stuff, the fear will go away. I think the other right. challenge though, is if you're single, it can be hard to seek out sex. Um, mm. in a way that makes you feel comfortable, especially if it's mm. with different people. I'm not discouraging mm. that. What I am just saying mm. is that, you know, when it comes to feeling uninhibited and being able mm. to explore what's erotic and fun and pleasurable and comfortable and making noises mm. and being stupid and messing up mm. and et cetera, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes that can be hard to do when you're doing that with like, you know, multiple different people. Sometimes it can be helpful yeah. to do that in a context of a safe relationship where you're not mm. freaked out about, oh my God, do they even like me? Are they going to reject me, et cetera. Um, mm. But that's not to say that you can't practice the casual sex either. Um, but that's sometimes yeah. a lot of the clients I see, they're like, well, I mean, I need to do this, but I don't really want to, I don't know, ask this right. random person to fist me. I, right. I kind of want someone that I feel comfortable <laughs> with. Um, yeah, the guy on the so, app down the street who I might run yeah, into. I don't want to go shop. to the back of the pickup truck and like party. No. <laughs> triggering, triggering. Yeah, um, I do though. Yeah, I mean, listen, that's a that's a fantasy. This might be horrible advice, but I was a big fan. I mean, since COVID, I have to say was a big fan of sex parties and group mm. activities. And I felt like that was such an easy way to go be a fly on the wall and see how certain things are done. And especially in the kink world, I could literally go with a mask and a wig on and like take notes. And I wasn't a freak. <laughs> I was actually a voyeur and I was like sexy and like a Wait, fly were you on actually the wall. taking notes or <laughs> I brought out my, my, uh, typewriter at no, they take your phones at the door. So, oh. uh, but like mentally I was like, okay, next time I come, I'm well, no pun intended. Next time I go to one of these events, I'm going well, I'm to glad to hear you came. Yeah, it's a great time. It's like I'm going to try, you know, the St. Andrews Cross or like I'm going to do it with these girls who seem to be like giggling in the corner who also don't know what they're doing. Or, you know, I'd run into a couple in the closet who's like, this is my first time. Ah! And, and it felt like I don't know if that's a, a good piece of advice, bad piece of advice, but I think sex parties are such a great uh learning ground but also like it's the expert dome too right like you could see amateurs and pro in all of in one <laughs> setting pro one social. <laughs> yeah i mean it's a normalizing experience you know where it's kind of like right um, exposure therapy <laughs> that's you can a, face yes. your fears um and yes. they're normalized because there's so many people who are pursuing enjoying and having experiences that you know you maybe mm. thought about that's yeah. great um, I want to talk about, so you mentioned you have I've actually never courses. been to a sex oh. party. What? You haven't? No. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that was such a surprise, but why not? I'm basically a virgin. Um, <laughs> virginity doesn't exist as a social construct. Thank um, you. I don't know. I don't even like parties. Um, I get, I get socially <laughs> overwhelmed. It's not, it's not a thing, I guess, for me. Surprisingly, I, do you live in LA or New York? Both. Oh, Okay. In LA, at least, I can't speak to New York because the buildings are so much smaller. But 
in LA, it's so spread out. And surprisingly, you can go the whole <laughs> night without talking to anybody. Like I've oh, been sometimes where I'm like, Maybe I should go is then. anyone going to approach me? Is anyone going <laughs> to, you know, want to diddle my doodles? No. Okay. I'm just going to walk around. And... That sounds so cute. <laughs> it did That's not going to be the title of my book. Oh um, yeah. There you go. I'll take only 2%. Thank uh, you. Okay, wait. Okay. So I want to go. You talked about how you have online sex courses that come with community chats and group mm-hmm. processing, you know which you call mm-hmm. yeah. your secret sauce. So first, can you tell me about like what exactly the courses are and then how group processing for sex therapy can be helpful? Because I have i don't think I've ever done that. Unless you count the sex parties, but that it's, wasn't really anyone. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a group process, just a different, different in a, expression. In a form. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a process group, but you're having <laughs> sex during it. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, my core is the courses. They're like programs. Um, it's actually really cool. The group sessions. So every month I do, it's like group therapy and people come and they talk about whatever they're going through. I have two, two programs. One's for sex called sex sessions and one is for relationships called love lessons. Mm. Um, but so both groups come and we meet and people just talk. So it's kind of like, I don't know, like a call-in show, but it's a or group <laughs> therapy or a webinar where there's participation. Mm. Um, so someone will share their experience. You know, I'm really having, I really want to explore this kink with my partner and I don't know how to do it. Or my partner wants to do this and I don't want to do it. Or a couple will come on and say, we're trying to explore sex and this shame stuff comes up and shuts us down. And Mm. I'll ask them more questions about, okay, well, what's coming up? Like what, um, has been your history? You know, what was it like Mm. at the beginning? What is masturbation like? Whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, it's cool. Uh, and people are really open and they share. Some people don't put on their videos. Some people do put on their videos. Some people just ask questions in a chat box. Um, but it's super Mm. cool. Um, and like everything people bring up is something that I've gone through. I know that mm. uh, most of my clients have gone through. Um, and, and I think that's a really helpful component of the sessions because yeah. as you were describing with the sex parties, um, it's really normalizing, you know, when you're hearing someone describe something that you're going through exactly. And you're like, oh my God, me too. Um, especially when it comes to sex, um, especially when we all have this fucked up history with learning about, you know, all these horrible myths about sex. Um, it's so helpful to hear people share their stories. Um, yeah. So, yeah, a group experience directly yeah. when it comes to having sex or talking about it um, can be really powerful. I had never thought about that. But, like, the truth is some of the most eye-opening conversations I've had has been in, like, a group of my friends or, like, you know, my, my, um, all women, uh, text chain is very different from like my all queer text chain whenever we're talking about sex and like those experiences are so different. And I think it's so important to get that like diversity of conversation. And it just made me think of a question, like, who do you think is better at sex? Gay people or straight people? Or who has less anxiety around sex? <laughs> um, I just feel bad for straight people. Um, no, that's so <laughs> terrible to say. So I our, our I audience take it back. is very Edit gay. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, no, I mean, I think every single person has sexual issues. Mm -hmm. Cis straight men have sexual issues. Yeah. (laughs) Just as as much as queer people do. However, um, depending on your identity, there are, you're going to have more issues. Yeah. So, you know, the layering of identities, um, mm-hmm. you know, when it becomes this intersectional experience can be really challenging because, you know, you grow up in a society yeah. that tells you you're worthless or that you're um, mm. less than, or that your pleasure isn't mm. important or, 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 mm. you know, it's going to be extra challenging, but everybody has and needs to work through sexual issues to some extent. Yeah. And I um, think, yeah, but I find that straight people, unfortunately, well, no. Okay. Mm, I'm just <laughs> going to say, yes, I think straight, right straight people, straight couples are talking much less about sex at the beginning. Um, because there you go. for straight people, they grow up being programmed to think about relationships, marriage, children, a traditional trajectory towards relationships. And there's also, um, I mean, for cis straight people, there's also a gender dynamic where mm-hmm. there's a, this real perceived lack of safety and, um, real mm. desire not to encroach on people's sense of comfort and safety. Um, and so there's a lot that gets unspoken for a lot of straight couples compared to a lot of queer couples, um, you know, that's in a non-traditional trajectory, Mm -hmm. um, or grew up with that thought, you know, that start talking about sex from the beginning. 
mm-hmm. um, but not all the time. There's no kind of universal thing, but that's what I find sure. most at least in my practice is that a lot of the gay couples, specifically the gay men that I see talk about sex right away. Right. It seems all, like I do wonder why that is where it feels so much. I don't want to like stereotype a group. So they're like the gay men are not. I know that's the challenge, but, but, I, but, <laughs> but some stereotypes are true. The gay yeah, men talk it, about sex. I think yeah. a lot more cis gay men. And it seems less intimidating to talk about as well. Like it, it doesn't have the weight that maybe a, a, like a woman approaching a man to talk about a, a sexual fear might be. And again, I live in Los Angeles in West Hollywood. I'm also talking about it from a very like niche per, per point yeah. of view, but I just wish there was, do you think it's because it's a man talking to a man about sex that it seems so much easier? Um, well, I think everybody's different. I mean, and the other thing though, is that it's not to say that this is inherently based on gender or sexuality. This is based mm. on the culture of gender and sexuality. So there's mm. a big difference. You know, it's not saying that men, cis men or any type of man more than any type of woman, it's cultural. Um, mm. so there's no like inherent, like men are se- more sexually driven than women. That's all crap. Um, yeah. Uh, it's cultural, um, but I think it's just because there's a, a much different culture with gay men around casual sex. So many gay yeah. men meet for casual sex. I love how I'm talking about this. Like many gay men, meet. <laughs> <laughs> um, casual sex is much more common in certain communities. So because of that, yeah, there's more conversation about it. Yeah. Um, you said something I, I want to skip ahead to uh, a philosophy I read on your website that said, you're not fucked up, your culture is. And you kind of just spoke a little bit about that. But yeah. what, what can, how can we dive into that a little bit more? What do you mean by that? Um, well, I don't know. I found that after doing therapy for a while, I found that people think that they're like specifically fucked up. They have this experience and it's them and they did this terrible thing and they're this terrible person or whatever. Um, and that's not even being cartoonish about it. People are mm-hmm. convinced um, when they experience normal challenges that they're fucked up. Um, but so yeah. I realized very quickly that it, I'm not really big into biology, and, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but I think we all grow up thinking that, you know, who we are is our genetics and like, you know, we have these biological disorders and whatever, when the reality is they're all just a kind of cultural constructs of, um, certain ways of understanding ourselves. Um, and I think they're highly problematic. Um, so there's that part of how we understand ourselves, but then there's also parts of the world in terms of all of these toxic aspects of our cultures in terms of racism and homophobia and transphobia and sexism, and misogyny mm-hmm. and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, that really change how we see ourselves, um, mm-hmm. and create some of those feelings of I'm not good enough. I like value. No one's going to love me. Um, mm-hmm. I'm anxious to be in this group of people because what if they find out that, um, mm-hmm. or blah, 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 blah. So those thoughts, I think, are specifically created by the world we live in. It's cold, Mm. it's uninviting, it's unloving, it doesn't provide us with the education we need to love ourselves Mm -hmm. um, or to help ourselves love other people um, Mm -hmm. or to fuck or anything. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. 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 I, I'm reading, um, Michael Pollan's, uh, I think it's called how to change your mind. And it's all Mm -hmm. about this guy learning about, um, about psychedelic therapy. So he does LSD mushrooms and, um, M E O D M M E O five DMT, the toad. Um, but in traditional psychedelic therapy, they allow three days for the experience. And on the first day they have the client or patient take MDMA to break down the barrier between client and patient to allow what they say is like five years of therapy in one day so that the next day when they do their Uh LSD, it's a lot less scary, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking last night about how I felt like that could be used in sex therapy where someone might be so terrified to come to a sex therapist and say like, here are my most shameful, deepest fears or inadequacies. And I just really need some, mo- I need us to do Molly together before I can like say that to someone, not me personally. I have no shame and no fear about this conversation, but how do you You're like, I'm on Molly right now. <laughs> Yeah. Um, how <laughs> do you like, help break down those barriers for someone starting sex therapy where you're like, do you know, are you like, you're not, 
you're not going all the way there. You're not digging deep enough. Or are people just like, so here's a photo of my penis. Um, this is the problem. <laughs> here's my partner. You know, like how, how, in your experience, uh, what are you seeing? No dick pics and such. <laughs> no dick pics. Um, no dick pics. Um, but I do accept dick pics from people that aren't my clients. There you go. I love a good sext. Um, we love that. Uh, no, I mean, everybody feels so uncomfortable. Um, but I, um, I'm very gentle. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's what I do. So I have a way of talking to people. I have questions. I really try to use humor a lot because, you know, we're talking about sex, not cancer. Um, I try to make it fun. Um, yeah. I notice, you know, uh, many, when I start asking questions, many people turn bright red. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll notice, I'm like, so it seems like you're a little red. Um, <laughs> we talk about the discomfort. Um, but I don't think I... I I've had a session where we talk about sex where someone hasn't felt uncomfortable. Um, mm. Because the reality is most people aren't asked directly, like, where did you learn how to masturbate? Like, they don't right. even think about it. So they're being asked yeah. questions they've never thought about. Um, sometimes mm. non-sexual, like, you know, I don't know, what was pleasure like with your, like, did you have fun with your mother as a child? Mm. Um, you know, sometimes that makes people feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> in therapy, we're asked and being asked, um, questions that are new. Um, yeah. Some things when it comes to sex are particularly scary for people. Um, but then there are sure some people that are just like, my dick curves to the left and <laughs> uh, it's hard to fuck my partner is a total bottom and I just don't want to do it and I don't know what to do. Um, yeah. But I think everyone feels uncomfortable talking about sex. That you bring up such a good point that you say you've never had, you know, a session or, or maybe a client relationship where it doesn't become awkward at some point, because like you said, the conversation often goes beyond physical sex, most often goes on beyond physical sex, I, I imagine. And yeah. you got to get to those like subconscious things. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also so, so many people are so afraid of being judged. Um, mm, you know, big time. I'm going to think they're crazy or fucked up or weird or reject them in one way or another. Um, and it's just a reflection of how I think we're also judged. All yeah. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> by the world and our partners and our family. And we just kind of acclimate to a sense of, okay, I'm going to be judged. So I can't, I'm not going to, to share everything. Right. Um, which is kind of, which is a bummer, but it's the reality. I feel that way about talking about having sex with a trans person because I mm. am a bisexual, pansexual, whatever you want to call it. And, I grew up in a society where no one was out as being trans. No one was talking about it. It wasn't until I moved to New York and then Los Angeles. And now I find myself feeling that fear again of like a kid about to have sex for the first time and feel like they don't have any idea what they're doing just because purely it's another stage of experiencing a new part of sex, though I claim to be such a sex expert, you know, or, or very uh, non-traditional, not shameful about talking about it. But I find that that's something I'm worried about for fear of being judged for sure, not only by the therapist, but that am I going to recognize some sort of internalized transphobia? And so I'd rather just not talk about it, keep it down, keep just waiting until the next something to pop up to to talk about it, right? Like I... It's not only the fear of someone else judging me, but me judging myself, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's the, the way you see other people seeing you is about you. Um, and so, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's the fear of being judged because you've, mm. you're judging yourself. Um, mm. But also what I find is that when people start talking about it after a couple of sessions, it's like, you know, talking about the weather. Um, right. So, you know, it's just important to push through that discomfort and therapy mm. is a really great place to do that as opposed to maybe mm. if you're with a friend that you don't particularly trust or you just want mm. your own space to do that. Right. Because you're literally um, paying for the space. <laughs> that's a good you know, point. You're like, like there you for should it. be getting like, something use out the of fucking it. space. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Um, I saw you repost something yesterday or two days ago and I thought it was so fucking funny where it was like, um, if you like the show euphoria, you're going to love therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So good. But I wish I, I could create these memes. They're you so, do. so great. I, I didn't make that. No, I know. But like you do create very viral, not, repostable content. Sure, but not not those funny memes. Like I wish I could be funny like that, but I'm just... You're very but funny. But so good. Also, so though, I, can, good. I love Euphoria, but I can barely tolerate it. It's so disturbing to me. Like I... I just, really? 
they're all so hot and it's like a great story but like i don't know i grew up in florida like i mentioned florida and this was yeah exactly my high school experience like same I'm which like, is why i'm like i'm triggered i don't want to watch this like <laughs> i lived well, through this like it's I don't... bringing up a lot for me right like it, it, so it is, is therapy up... then yes it is therapeutic maybe you should watch it with your therapist oh god she seems very busy i don't know she's i, I have another lady therapist um uh she that we don't really I, I don't see a sex therapist right now, but I would like to get back into it as the world opens back up. I think that is a goal of mine this year, if while we're getting safer with seeing people and strangers, just to let you okay. know. <laughs> sure. Um, um, why wait? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it feels safer. It feels safer to use the excuse of COVID than being like, I'd rather challenge myself in my relationship again not necessarily challenge, oh. but like grow well, through something with a relationship. It's not really, I mean, we've, we've, we've done everything. You but, can do it whenever you want. Yeah. But it, you can it's, do it virtually. You don't have to see a therapist in person. Oh, hundred percent. I'm never going into a therapist's office again. I will only. I'm, I don't have my office anymore. That, yeah. Well, no. it's, it seems no. it's like a waste of money and you don't have to deal with parking in Los Angeles and New York. No, thanks. <sighs> I would, I would only do online therapy for the rest of my life. This episode is not sponsored by BetterHelp, but y'all know that that's my favorite recommendation is online therapy where I can do it in my bed with that's Oreos. So much easier. And like, so much more comfortable. Oreos. Yeah. I had my therapist though tell me though that one time she did get a session where the guy wouldn't turn on his camera and she's like, turn on your camera. Like, why, why are you being weird? And he was in the bathtub. <laughs> that's and she cute. was like, Okay, never mind. Turn your camera. <laughs> She's like, "Wow, you really can do therapy from fucking anywhere." <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I mean, good gonna... for him. That sounds really comforting. And yeah, that's like self care, a warm hug, calming, a warm hug all at once. Wow. Yeah, um, I can't believe we've already been talking for so long. But I want to wrap up and Ten ask, times. like, what do you see? maybe not only for yourself, but the community as a whole, as the future of sex therapy, what do you hope for? What do you, what are you seeing happen? Well, I mean, I think the community for sex therapy, for sex therapists, um, compared to just for sexuality and sexual expression. I mean, I think it's just, we're going to, I mean, I, I, we're in a great place, um, when it comes to sex that we're talking about it more, thankfully, um, you know, there are like memes about sex now, whereas before mm. memes, you know, we couldn't look, find this <laughs> stuff anywhere, even if you were intentionally looking for it. So, right. um, I think the more we're bombarded with some of this stuff, um, the better, um, yeah. I think we're just going to hopefully normalize, um, a variety of genders and sexual expressions, it, which is what I'm the most excited about, um, you know, in terms of gender and sexuality. Yeah. Um, but I think these sexual scripts, these heteronormative sexual scripts are going to persist for a long time. Like yeah. the idea of sex is penetration. I, I, I that's, is, I don't think that's ever going to go away. Yeah. Um, which is so heteronormative and so much based on just getting pregnant. It's just right. ridiculous, but still people are like, we well, didn't have sex. And I'm like, well. you didn't fuck you didn't do, what do you mean? Yeah. Um, right. Oral sex. I mean, so some of these sexual scripts I think are going to persist, but I'm really excited about, mm. um, you know, the, how normalized and, um, celebrated, a, you know, diversity has become sexually. Um, cause mm. I think that has a trickle down effect for people regardless of their sexual expression. Um, uh, so I think that's right. pretty cool. I'm really excited about that. And also it helps yeah. people feel, um, less shameful and loving of themselves uh, and empowered. So, um, that will have a big impact on people's overall wellness. Um, but so yes. uh, I'm excited for that. I think that's, that's the future. Yeah. Queers. Yeah. And I'm really yeah. excited for the next generation. They're carrying us, you know, I feel like they're the ones breaking I mean, so much. Seriously. I know, Every generation does something the... that breaks the door wide open for the next one. Right. It's like, don't forget about your elders. Okay. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Seriously. Well, Todd, thank you so much for doing this. Where can the confidants follow you, find you, sign up for courses? Uh, yeah, follow me on Instagram at your diagnonsense. Um, and there are links to my website and courses. I would spell out my website, but unfortunately I picked my name, which was dumb. I should have done like blue yellow dot com. But <laughs> it's my full name, which is Todd Aspire. Um, so check me it's out on Instagram yeah. at your diagnonsense. Your diagnosis. Awesome. Well, Confidants, mm -hmm. thanks so much for tuning in. 
Don't forget to rate this on five five stars. I was going to say, Todd, believe it or not, this podcast gets over 20,000 listens a week, and we only have 1,000 reviews on iTunes. And I think that math does not pan out. Why are people not rating this? I mean, I'm not good at math, but I can tell that doesn't sound right. That's it. Confidants. Why are you? We can rate on Spotify now. We can rate on all podcasts. So just... Take a moment. Pause this right now. I'm going to go do that right now. Oh, my God, Todd. I fucking love you. You're the best. Um, So besides that, thank you so much, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you all.